like a normal stock, but but still cash. So we're gonna get that cash and we use that the cash to buy back shares. Why? Well, the academics who built this, they decided that that cash has to go somewhere. Hypothetically, it's kind of useful to like just think of it as, wow, we might as well use the cash to buy back shares. Because that's sort of like representative of what could be used with the cash in terms of value generation. So anyways, the theory is the theory, but this has been used for many decades uh, in invest banking. Quick example, you know, $10 stock price, 100 shares, like, you know, if we have these three tranches of options, only this tranche is in the money, the $6 here, it's below $10. So we're going to exercise it. So that's the five right there. Uh, sorry, the arrows. <laughs> uh, you know, I do always do these edits live because if I don't, I'll never do them. <laughs> All right. So uh, there we go. The five is pointed out. And then you're going to get 30 bucks of cash, five times six. We're going to use that cash to buy back our own shares at 10 bucks. That's three shares bought back. So there we go. Minus three. So that's how that works. Okay. So treasury stock method, and I think that is mostly it, but one common question is how does debt affect price of earnings? Well, debt actually make, usually makes P over E go down. So why is that? Debt makes equity riskier. How does debt make equity riskier? Um, well, specifically it, it increases the beta, the like risk, market risk, and then that would include, increase the cost of equity, which is like the discount rate, which would then reduce the stock price. So now that being said, sometimes P over E will go up if it rep, it's a good signal, like the, the company really needs cash and this, this will help them survive. Or they can use that cash to do something positive, like buy a company, buy back shares. So like any answer, sometimes it depends. All right, let's move on. I'm going to go on to a new section here. Um, DCF. Okay, so I, do, I think I have to reshare. Um, no, we, we can see it, Josh. Oh, you can see it. Oh, perfect. Okay, great, good. Technology is on my side today. That's good. All right. <laughs> um, I'm not even that old, but sometimes I feel like an old geezer when I'm trying to, I'm very good with PowerPoint and Excel. Trust me with that. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, DCS, I'm sure you guys have probably heard about these in class. Um, you know, it's the idea that you get cash tomorrow, it's worth less. Right. And you, you might've seen this formula before where you're, you're kind of like discounting it by, um, you know, the number of years using this formula. Okay. So that's fine. You know, DCF is basically like the sum of the projection period plus the terminal value because we're not going to project forever. Um, so we only project how long we can project for, right? And then after we get all that, you know, you can kind of arrive to enterprise value, you can get to equity value, and then you divide by fully diluted shares of standing, which we just went through the treasury stock method, how to calculate that. And then finally, uh, implied share price. Okay, but how do we actually get to the cash flow, right? How do we get these cash flows? We use what's called unlevered free cash flow. Now, what is that? It's cash flow without the effect of debt. So take a look here. After tax earnings plus DNA, DNA is non cash, right? Actually, let me start from the top here EBIT. We're not going to include the effect of interest. So we just times one minus the tax rate right away. Good. So after tax earnings is what we get. We're going to add DNA. Why are we adding DNA? And why are we not including interest? Well, that's because it's unlevered. Okay. So that, that makes sense. No interest. But why DNA? Um, well, it's not cash, right? We, we want the cash impact. So we're going to take, we're going to add back DNA. We're going to subtract CapEx because that's a cash outflow. You're going to buy plants and equipment. And then we subtract increase in every capital. This represents money that tied up in the operation of the business. So in other words, like for example, let's say I have a shoe store. I got to buy shoes. <laughs> I have to have, to have inventory. So I put, uh, let's say I put $10,000 down for inventory. Well, that money's tied up in the inventory. The inventory is sitting there. It has, I have to have some inventory. So that's an example, right? Um, accounts receivable, accounts payable, 
all those are involved in the daily operation of the business. But they can usually what happens is as your business grows, you put more money into inventory, into accounts receivable, whatever it is, um, because your business gets bigger. Okay, so that's what we use to discount. What about levered free cash flow? Levered free cash flow. This is unlevered is without the impact of debt. It goes to both equity and debt holders. Levered, is, it goes just to the equity holders. So we want the impact of debt here. So here we're going to start net income. Um, interest, as you can see, it's already deducted. So we have the effect of debt here. DNA, these steps probably look familiar. That's because they're the exact same as before. Um, so we're going to do all those three. So we're starting with net income, which is different. And now we're going to add in debt repayments or subtract. And then add debt borrowings. Um, and then this leverage free cash flow kind of represents cash that you have left over, um, which can be used to pay back debt um, after any like mandatory repayments. Because oftentimes debt will like make you pay back 1% every year. So yeah, this is the cash left over um, to pay back debt. Now, you can also kind of go from unlevered to leverage just by you know putting in the impact of debt. So unlevered free cash flow minus after-tax interest, minus debt repayments, plus debt borrowings. But always after-tax. <laughs> tax shield's important. We have one question in yep. the, the chat. So the question asking, is a networking capital reversed at a point? How do you account for that? Is a networking capital reversed at a point? Um, so I think they're talking about probably like when you're doing unlevered free cash flow or, or levered free cash flow. Okay, how do we calculate this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Networking capital, quite simply, is, um, I, I don't know if you can, can you see this Excel, Brandon? No, no, no. Okay, okay. Excel right now. Okay, no worries. We have to Excel. Um, so, networking capital is current operating current assets minus operating current liabilities. Um, and operating current assets is uh, things like, uh, accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses, um, things like that. And then operating current liabilities are um, accounts payable, other current liabilities. I don't include cash in there, you'll notice. Um, and I also don't include uh, like tax payable, like income tax payable. It's really stuff that's involved in the operation of the business. After I found operating current assets and operating current liabilities, I subtract the two. So OCA minus OCL, kind of short forms for that, um, is equal to the networking capital. Uh, so yeah, current assets minus current liabilities equals networking capital. And then you figure out the increase year to year. So you just compare that with the last year. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, to be honest. <laughs> kind of wish I could have used Excel. Um, but does that make sense? I don't know if that was confusing. Um, okay, cool. Brandon, uh, do you know how, how I can like get my Zoom back? <laughs> uh, to, um, to like share your Excel sheet? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's, I, I think it's, if you press the, there should be a thing on the top saying like share screen. Um, and then you can probably like, move to another like screen essentially on your laptop but um the person who asked a question said that it, it makes sense to them you're asking. okay okay great yeah <laughs> okay yeah so because i it would have been nice if i could show you guys a model later but uh i guess we're kind of limited by the technology here unfortunately i just can't get it to work um no worries no worries um okay so we're gonna move on here So um, what, we, what do we do with these cash flows once we've projected them? We have to discount them to the present period. Actually, one, before I jump on, so the reason we use unlevered free cash flow for DCFs rather than levered is because this goes to both equity and debt holders. But to be honest, the biggest reason is because it's easier. <laughs> it's a lot easier. There's a lot of noise. Interest is not really something people care about if you're valuing a stock because you care less about the capital structure and more about like the cash flow generation. So with unlevered free cash flow, you're saying 
forget the capital structure. I don't care if you borrowed your money. I don't care if, you know, your rich dad gave you your money. It doesn't matter. I just want to know what you're making. <laughs> um, lever free cash flow is different. Lever free cash flow is used more by banks and private equity firms. Um, things like that, finance institutions, because they care about the debt. They care about interest. Interest is core to their business. Let, like private equity firms, they borrow money to buy companies. So that borrowing, it's almost like a cost of doing business. Same with banks, right? They, they borrow money and lend it out at a higher rate. So they will use leverage free cash flow. A difficult question is that's asked is, if you do a DCF with unlevered free cash flow versus a DCF with levered free cash flow, Will they get you the same value? The answer is probably not. <laughs> Theoretically, it's true that they could, but let's, let's examine why. Um, well, unlevered free cash flow, it's all in the discount rate. What do we discount unlevered free cash flows by? WAC, which is here, which we'll talk about, right? Because it's, it's going to include both the cost of equity and the cost of debt. And what do we assume in WAC? In WAC, we have to assume a constant capital structure. So this is the formula. You may have seen it before. You see, you see, we're assuming that for the rest of the time, uh, this company will be financed by, you know, say 30% of equity and 70% debt. That's very levered, but okay, just an example. Whereas in reality, that might actually change over time. Maybe one year they pay down some debt, another year they take more debt, it's gonna fluctuate. So that's why it's never gonna match up because here you're saying you make an assumption that's like, this is gonna what what's gonna happen forever when in real life that's probably not <laughs> what's happening. So that's why they're almost never the same. But they're usually close. Okay, let's talk about this whack. I'm sure you've seen it during a class. You know, you've seen this formula. Always remember tax, 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 debt. Debt is after tax. Debt is cheaper. Why is debt cheaper? Well, it's after tax. It's also less risky, right? Less risky. less likely than a, than a stock to go down. Okay, let's talk about equity. How do we get equity? Well, um, this is kind of it. You know, the risk free is a 10 year treasury, the beta market risk, slope of the line. If we regress individual stock return over stock market return, you know, like that slope of the line is the beta. So basically beta is like, if if the stock market goes up 1% and your beta is two, then you go up 2%. It's just all based on this line. That's what beta is. You can also like calculate beta by levering and relevering. I won't go through that. You can kind of look at the slides, but you know, private company, you can't find a beta, you find comparables. Take their levered beta, Unlever using this formula to get unlevered beta. Find the median, then relever it using the target capital structure. So yeah, you're just taking betas, applying this formula, finding the median, and then applying that formula again to find the new levered beta. Okay, this equity risk premium can be found from like the big four. You can just Google it. So you can get a cap in pretty quickly. Okay, so we figured out, we've done all, most of the things in DCF, right? We we, we figured out cash flows. Um, oh yeah, networking capital, somebody asked about. I, I guess there are some slides about that here. Um, but yeah, the, the person who, uh, I guess another thing to mention about networking capital is like, usually you find the most recent, like day sales to standing, days payable, days inventory, um, using this formula. Um, this is just should be 365 days in period because it's like a year. So yeah, those are formulas that are good for that. And then, and then you assume them to be the same and just hold a constant. And that's how you project networking capital. Kind of like they did here. Uh, okay. In this case, actually they, if you're in a rush, you can also just like assume the change in networking capital is like based off a percentage. So you just say like, oh, it's 1% of revenue every year if you're in a rush. Okay, so let's talk about terminal value. Two ways to do it. Perpetuity growth, X and multiple. X and multiple, find the median, mature median in the industry and multiply by EBITDA. Uh, 